What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. This is BDGE. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. I am Nicholas. Welcome to another Saturday video. Every Saturday, we put out two videos. We have this one, and then we have our Patreon-only live stream today at 1 p.m. Eastern time. If you are a Patreon member, you will have access to that. To become a Patreon member, patreon.com slash BDGE. Otherwise, I will be uploading it afterwards uh, where everyone who is a Patreon member gets to ask me their sit-start questions for the week, and I answer them to the best of my ability usually doesn't work. Today we're here to make some money, which is why we dive into our top DFS plays and our top monkey knife fight player prop games for week four. So this video again will be split up into two parts. There will be timestamps down below for each part. The first of which is monkeyknifefight.com where they have the best player prop games to play to help y'all earn the revenue, diversify the revenue, pay the mortgage, whatever you want to twist that shit into. We're going to make some money today. Second half of the video, we will be diving into our top DFS plays, DraftKings FanDuel with good friend of the show, Joe Holka, DFS specialist. If you enjoy the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. Go check out Joe's. I love y'all. Let's get into today's video. <laughs> All right, head over to monkeyknifefight.com, monkeyknifefight.com. When you sign up, throw a light $10, $20 into your account, trail my picks. If you do so, use the promo code BDGE, and they will hit you up with a 100% deposit match on whatever you deposit. You throw 20 bucks in, they'll give you an extra 20 bucks to mess around with. Head over to monkeyknifefight.com, BDGE, when you sign up. Click play now, you'll sign in, you'll be ready to roll. You can play any sports. They got all the sports going on. So even when it's the offseason, you could do your player prop games, whatever, whatever, whatever. On the homepage, they will always have the NFL games because that is what's most near and dear to our hearts. When I try to pick the games, I always look for games in which I can exploit usually the over. Um, I look for players or games in which I think they're going to score a lot of points, whether that be because of pacing or injuries or matchups or whatever. The first one on this slate is going to be the Cardinals versus the Seattle Seahawks. I absolutely love this from both sides of the ball. I think this is going to be a lot high, more high scoring than uh, originally anticipated. I'm not sure what the over under is. We'll check it out real quick. You can always head over to ESPN.com slash NFL slash scoreboard to find out the over unders and the lines for the games. They'll be listed right next to the games here. What do we got for Cardinals and Seahawks? Minus five and a half for Seattle on the road in Arizona over under of 48. I'm looking at these games. They have so many different player prop games that you could actually play with. Some of them have to do with fantasy points. Some of them have to do with actual statistics like passing yards, receptions, whatever. Now, I love the reception collection. Let's talk about the game first of all. Why do I love this game? First of all, just the pace of both of these teams. Now, Arizona is first in pace in the NFL. Obviously, they run a shitload of plays. They run the second most plays per game despite not having the ball that often. So even if they have a bad game on offense, they're still running a ton of plays, which obviously translates into a lot of statistics. Seattle on the other side of the ball, while obviously they want to be a running team, they still ranked 12th in pace. And they've actually ran the 10th most plays per game so far in the NFL, largely due to their defense. So they still are the third most run heavy offense in the NFL during neutral situations. They run the ball 50% of the time in neutral situations. But like I said, the problem is their defense, particularly the eighth worst graded pass coverage defense. They feature a true pass funnel with the 10th best graded run stopping defense in the NFL, allowing the fourth fewest rushing yard and a league high 75% opponent pass rate during neutral situations. This is per Pat Thorman of Establish the Run, his pace and snaps article that he does every week. Their pass offense is their weak point. Arizona obviously runs a ton of plays and they let up a lot of passing to quarterbacks. That is where we're going to attack. And on the flip side, of course, Arizona does not have a good pass defense. They don't have a good run defense either, but I think we're going to see a game in which the pace is going to have to go up, which is great for Russell Wilson and the rest of the offense. So reception collection, you have to pick three players to hit a certain number of receptions and you choose if you want to go over or under 17 and a half, 18 and a half or 21 and a half. Obviously the higher reception total, the higher the prize pool is going to be. So if we want to pick three players that we think are going to go over 18 and a half, we'll get three X on whatever money we throw down. Again, 
when you sign up, make sure you use that promo code BDGE and you will get a 100% deposit match bonus. I'm looking at this game. I see three smash button plays. We're going to go Kirk. We're going to go Tyler Lockett and we're going to go Larry Fitzgerald. These guys are getting so many damn targets, right? We're going to pull it up right now. We're going to go over to FF Today, which is one of the top statistic websites for fantasy football. So let's look at some of the target leaders on the year. But we have Christian Kirk, fifth in the NFL in terms of targets. Actually, fourth because Devonta Adams already has four games on here. Christian Kirk, fourth in the NFL in targets. Larry Fitzgerald is sixth in the NFL in targets. So we have both of them are top six players in terms of overall targets. And then we have Tyler Lockett, 16th. And if you narrow out all the players who already had four games, one, two, three, that would move up to 13th. So we have Lockett, Christian Kirk, and Larry Fitzgerald, who are going to be playing in a game with a high pace. And they're going to be seeing a ton of targets. We've seen Tyler Lockett get double digit targets in both of the last two games, 12 targets, eight targets, 12 targets for Christian Kirk over the last three games. Larry Fitzgerald, 13, 11, 7. Obviously, they're coming off their worst passing game against Carolina, but that's a tougher pass defense. Now we're going against Seattle, who obviously lets up a lot of points. I just see this as an absolute smash. If you want to get a little bit risky, you'll go with the 5X and you think they hit over 21 and a half. I will probably play it a little safer and hit that 18 and a half over. So all that means is between the three of them, they have to hit 19 total receptions. I'm sure one of them will go off for like nine or 10 receptions and that leaves just like five and four for the other two guys. So I would smash at 18 and a half over on the 3x and throw down whatever you want to throw down to, depending on how much money you put in. This is probably the one I felt the best about in all of the weeks so far. I've done a monkey knife fight. I might just stay within this game to be honest with you. I, bl I love the pace and I love what we're probably going to see here. I like the over under on the passing yards for both guys. I like Kyler Murray. I like Russell Wilson both to go over their 280 and 265 passing yards. Russell Wilson, obviously they're going to want to run the ball, but due to the pace, they're going to throw the ball a little bit more too, right? That's always been the problem with Russell Wilson is do we get enough volume to see the passing numbers go up? And last week we obviously saw him crush that number. I believe he had 400 passing yards, 50 attempts. They're not going to be that high, of course, but they will be up there just due to the nature of uh, this game. Kyler Murray went over 300 passing yards in both of the first two games. Now they're back at home. And I think this is a passing defense that will be pretty generous to both of them. So I would honestly hit the over on both of these guys. And the same thing with the fantasy points. I would go with the over on the fantasy points on both Russell Wilson and Kyler Murray, 20 and a half, 19 and a half. Let's get that cracking. And there are probably a bunch of other ones that you could do here. Similar to the reception total thing I just did, where it's over 18 and a half, 19 and a half, 21 and a half. You can do that with um, touchdowns, right? So they have a one and a half, a two and a half, and a three and a half. And you could pick three players in which you want their total touchdown number to be over whatever that pace is. So you could go like Chris Carson, depending on whether or not Rashad Penny plays, David Johnson, and like Tyler Lockett or something like that, which I think are great as well. So this is going to be my only monkey knife fight section of the video. I'm not going to go into a second game just because I absolutely love this game. Obviously, keep a close eye on Rashad Penny if you're going to be betting on any Chris Carson player props. Keep a close eye on any other injuries or weather or whatever that pops up throughout any of the games that you play. But this is my favorite game, Cardinals, Seahawks. Go deposit on monkeyknifefight.com right now using promo code BDGE and bring home some money for the wife. I know y'all probably been losing a lot of money so far as NFL season because again, that's how Vegas stays in business. They win, you lose. Probably bet the Browns over on their fucking wins for the season. Y'all are going to lose that one. But come back. Come bike stronger than ever. Win some money with your boy. MonkeyKnifeFight.com. Promo code BDGE. Let's hop over to the DFS section of the video with Mr. Joe Hogan. Money to make in the meantime. So we're going to be doing, as always, our position by position breakdown and talk about general strategy throughout the week, because obviously it alters as new players come into the mix and guys and their holdouts and things like that. We're not quite there with Melvin Gordon yet, but we're ready to start. Obviously, Joe, welcome back to the headquarters. Let's talk about quarterbacks. Now, I have been uh, I, I am a member of uh, Establish the Run. Nice. So I get data that has to do with snaps and pace. And there is one game in particular that really intrigues me. And I like both quarterbacks going in this slate. That is Kyler Murray and Russell Wilson, the Cardinals versus the Seahawks. And I have a feeling just based on me talking with you throughout the first couple of weeks, uh, you're going to be a fan of both of these quarterbacks. You're going to be a fan of this game overall and, and attacking this game from quarterback and the wide receiver position. Now we have uh, Russell Wilson, I believe, at 6,100 on DraftKings. We have Kyler Murray at 6,000. And then there's also Daniel Jones sitting down there. They have not priced him properly yet. I believe he's at 5,300. He'll be home against the Washington Redskins coming off a monster four-touchdown week. Um, obviously, he got into the end zone twice to uh, the satisfaction of the Giants fans, just football fans overall because the kid got so much hate during the draft process. We're excited for him now. 
Um, he came out and absolutely did his thing. So from a pace perspective, we're looking at this Cardinals and Seahawks game, and you're thinking, well, you know, the Seahawks don't actually pass the ball that much. They're a pretty slow-paced team, but their defense has been pretty shitty this year, which has opened up a little bit more passing volume from Russell Wilson. On that side of things, we, uh, we obviously know the Cardinals are the fastest-paced team in the NFL right now. They've run the second-most place plays, although they haven't really been in control in terms of time of possession. So it's good to see the volume there, which means there should be volume on the flip side. Do you love these two guys in this in this matchup as much as I do? Because I feel like you do. You're on it, man. These these are these are the guys oh. that, that I was going to bring up. Uh, I, I definitely think that Russell Wilson um, could end up being extremely popular in cash games. Uh, you mentioned Daniel Jones, who who will get to a lot of people uh, kind of pumping his tires throughout the week uh, for cash games at his price. But uh, we'll talk about that game. Let's talk about this Cardinals and Seahawks game first. And, and I think you hit the nail on the head. Just the amount of plays that are going to be in this game that it, it's an interesting slate because we we don't have uh as much to pay up at running back as we normally do uh with, without zeke on the slate obviously no saquon barkley no camara it, it's a little bit of, of a different kind of slate but I, I think that anytime we can kind of target this cardinals team it's going to be something that we we want to continue to do i will say from the start russell wilson week has never worked out for me in dfs <laughs> Um, so that scares me a little bit. Um, he, I even remember a couple of years back where it was, uh, I feel like every time I played him and Doug Baldwin, I guess caught the floor game for those guys, but, uh, pretty tough spot to fail against the Cardinals. I think, uh, I get that they're uh, on the road, but they are slight favorites in this game as well. Russell Wilson does give us uh, that little bit of rushing equity that we want. Um, decent team total, especially for being on the road. His yards per attempt is actually very strong this year. That's definitely a metric that I'm, I'm definitely prioritizing at the quarterback position. 6,100, phenomenal price for Russ. Uh, even on FanDuel, he's at 7,800. So I, I definitely think that, I mean, if, if you can make an argument that Russell Wilson's been almost as efficient as Mahomes and Lamar Jackson this year. So um, just from his from pure uh, efficiency standpoint, uh, I, I do think that um, now that he's kind of returned to his rushing ways, we, we did see that he's had over five attempts uh, per game uh, this year. So I think that salaries might be, tight enough, but I think he's still definitely within reach on DraftKings in particular. Kyler, I think is, he's just, he feels like he's like the quarterback pivot every week. Like everyone wants to play the quarterback that's yeah. going to be against the Cardinals. I, I still love Kyler Murray. I know he's not really pushing the ball downfield. So I just mentioned yards per attempt. Kyler Murray is someone that's kind of been dinking and dunking down the, down the field. But I mean, his weapons are just getting peppered with these short area targets. Uh, we'll talk about David Johnson in a bit. Um, I think he's my favorite guy to go to uh, with Kyler Murray this week. But Christian Kirk, Larry Fitzgerald, their prices are still very solid. So um, I think that he's still uh, priced to a point six k uh, where it makes a ton of sense. Um, I, I do think that Russell Wilson for just a hundred more, probably the higher equity play for cash games. will will have a lot more ownership for sure. Uh, Daniel Jones at, at fifty three hundred. Uh, we mentioned him uh, a bit last week uh, when we were talking about some of the the rookie quarterbacks. Like he's a guy that just Danny Dimes just balled out in the preseason. So I, I still think that he's a really good play this week. But in particular, I, I just like him because, like, the, the defense in this game just is going to be few and far between, right? Both of these teams, uh, Washington and the Giants, they, they haven't really been shown the ability to stop anyone. So I think that there's going to be a lot of options in this game. Uh, a lot of pretty it, – it's a pretty tight target share there for the Giants as well now without Saquon. Um, I, I think you pretty much know where the targets are going to go. So that there's a lot of value in that. Um, with all this talk around the, the Russell Wilson and uh, just the, the Kyler Murray, just that game, uh, Danny Dimes, like those three guys, I think that's going to be where most of the ownership kind of skews towards. I, I'm interested in Lamar Jackson again, Patrick Mahomes in the dome for the first time, I think is interesting. Um, I mean, they're definitely going to be, um, you're going to need some value to make it work. But like I said, there's not as many running backs to pay up for. So those are kind of the guys that, that I'm uh, zoned in on right now. But you hit the nail on the head with that Seahawks game for sure. Okay, yeah. There will be a lot of equity. And you know what? You said you do mainly DraftKings right now, at least for, for this point in the season. And you might switch over and, you know, diversify the, the portfolio a little bit. But I do have a question for DraftKings. I, I don't know if you know the answer at all. Um, do you, first of all, do you gamble at all, like on the actual games themselves, or are you only a daily guy, a daily guy? Yeah. So betting for me is, is more of like, uh, just for fun, uh, especially like just stuff against the spread. I think it's really fun to do that. It doesn't really take a whole lot, um, of research to do that sort of thing. I think that the prop market is extremely inefficient. So if you're just trying to grind out, um, just a, a nice ROI, I think prop 
bets is, is kind of the way to go. You can't get a lot of volume down on those. So there's not really uh, a lot of incentive for the bookmakers to spend a lot of time on those lines. So you'll, you'll find inefficiencies. I know you're doing some prop stuff on your channel as well. So that's kind of the direction that I go um, with sports betting. I do play DraftKings and FanDuel this part of the year. I, I do like to stick to DraftKings a little bit. I, I think it's easier to predict uh, where the targets are going to go. And, and FanDuel is always uh, – the pricing is a little bit looser typically, so it's easier to build really good teams. And it's also extremely touchdown heavy. So I prefer DraftKings. I do play both. Uh, the big tournament that I always play uh, is on DraftKings every week, though, in the 1500. Okay. The reason I ask is because this weekend I wanted to bet on some games – I'm in New York right now, so I couldn't figure out how to get the money in and made me like, I, you know, confirm location or whatever. But I was back in New Jersey. I go back every Monday or Tuesday to film something. So I put money into my account, but I put it onto the DFS side, the, um, just the daily stuff. Nice. And I thought, well, not nice because I didn't want to <laughs> use it there, right? I only wanted to use it for the actual game. No, you have to. But it, yeah, I know. Well, that was my question to you. Do you know if like by accident I put it on daily, I wanted to use it for actual game stuff but it's not letting me bet like every time i go to the gambling side it says zero dollars in my account i go back it has my money but you're allowed to do it vice versa like if i put thirty dollars onto the gambling side it lets me use it daily but not vice versa so it seems like i'm not allowed to take my daily money and use it on like spreads and over unders and stuff yeah i don't know you might be able to transfer it over i'm not sure obviously i'm in minnesota so i, I can't do the the stuff on the DraftKings site uh, unfortunately for the sports betting side so uh, I'm kind of limited to some of the offshore stuff there, but I bet they would transfer it over for you, that for sure. Okay, yeah, I'm going to have to look into that because it doesn't make it easy. But one thing that does seem quite easy is, uh, as I've learned, is these running backs. Just just take the guys that get the volume. And right now, there are a few guys. You mentioned David Johnson, and I, you know, he's just not someone I really buy into overall because I look at things more from a season-long perspective, and I just – he just hasn't looked good. You know, and I, that doesn't always matter when it comes to fantasy because he's getting the volumes, he's getting a ton of targets, um, and that has translated into fantasy points. I just don't think he has the ceiling that we had hoped for, him being like the 2016 David Johnson. But he's priced at $6,800. When I'm looking at the rest of the options here, I mean, C-Mac just seems like a guy you can't possibly not pay up for. He is the most expensive running back on this league at 8800 They're playing at Houston. This should be a pretty high-paced game as well. Um, I would not suggest paying up for Saquon Barkley at 8500 He's the second <laughs> highest priced guy there. But then we have Austin Eckler. And the Chargers just ruled out both Justin Jackson and Mike Williams, which just adds to more of their injury concerns. Melvin Gordon, there's a very, 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 very small chance that we actually see him suit up. So it seems like Austin Eckler's in line for a 20-plus touch workload against probably the worst defense in the NFL right now, the Miami Dolphins. So Eckler seems like another guy, especially in PPR, that you can't really pass up on. The third guy – now, I guess this will be the debate for you, assuming that you want McCaffrey and Eckler in your lineups, is David Johnson. And I'm looking at Karrion Johnson because at $5,400, he's $1,400 less than David Johnson. They're going to be playing at home uh, against the Chiefs. And obviously, we know the Chiefs are going to get theirs. They're going to put up a 30, 35 points a game that they usually do. Now, typically at Arrowhead, you know, a lot of people go into these games with the mindset they're like, oh, it's the Chiefs. They're going to be high scoring. They're going to pass well a lot. But the Chiefs actually play pretty good defense when they're at home. Now, they're going to be in Detroit – and they're going to have to put up points. And we're seeing carry on coming off of, uh, I believe, his career high in terms of workload last week, 20 carries. He only turned it into like 35 yards on the ground. But if there's going to be a game in which he's going to get the carries and the targets, it's probably this one at home against the Chiefs. So I kind of like throwing carry on into that flex spot. Um, now, I know that we don't even really look below that number because we're always looking for the guys with the volume. So $5,400, carry on Johnson seems like the lowest price guy you're going to go with. Is that kind of um, what you're looking for at DFS this week? C-Mac, Eckler, David Johnson, carry on? Yeah, so uh, let's touch on David Johnson quickly. And I think this is where the biggest differences probably come from uh, season long to DFS. It, it's definitely a, a price thing for me with David Johnson. Like, I, I'm with you. Like, the upside really hasn't been there. He still is a top 10 back. If we really want to get down yeah. to it over the first three weeks. Uh, I did like that he was a little bit more – involved in the passing game and I mean yeah this, this game just sets up so well for plays that it's really hard to project DJ for I mean less than 18 touches 20 touches something like that hopefully um, so 6800 he get, he's just a screaming value uh, I, he's even uh, a better value on Fandle actually and 
And it's, it's not a, a, an amazing matchup by any means against Seattle, but they really struggled to tackle this year. They're actually 29th in the league uh, with uh, PFF's tackling grade through the first three weeks. So that, I think that that's something that um, could benefit someone like DJ who will break tackles. I, I definitely have my doubts if he can give us a ceiling game here. Uh, but I think his price point's at a, at a spot where, yeah, I, I would be considering him in my flex. Uh, I don't think we need to spend too much time on Christian McCaffrey. I, I think that he's still – um, and with all these other guys off the slate, I, I think that he's going to be the highest owned running back probably for good reason. Um, I, I love the carry on call. I actually think that at 5,400, if you don't want to play DJ and maybe he makes you a little bit nervous, uh, that's another spot where it's like purely volume and, and price. And I, I happen to think that carry on is a pretty, pretty talented back. We've seen him get a little bit more involved, which is nice. Um, so I, I'm in on that, especially in the dome um, against KC. Hopefully he just gets a few more catches than normal. I, I think that he's another guy that his price gets really bad. Uh, we should talk about Wayne Gallman. Um, so in DFS, this is what uh, most people will tell you is, is the free square, right? So he's, he's 4,600. He's a starting running back in the NFL. A lot of people will just be like, you have to play him in cash games. Um, I'm not sure he's, he's a lock, but I mean, at 4,600, it's really tough for him to fail. Um, so he's going to be massively owned just because of his price and because of Washington's defense. Um, I, I'm actively trying to figure out ways to get away from Goldman in tournaments because I'm not sure exactly what the ceiling would be there. Um, yeah. But I, I, I'm with you. I, I think that we're pretty much on, on the crab so far, man. I, I think for me, it's it's going to be McCaffrey. Um, and then trying to decide on Eckler and Dalvin Cook, I think, is a really tough decision at this point. I feel like I talk about Dalvin Cook every week. Um, so – 8,300, he's not 7K anymore. Like, it's getting all the way up there. Like, Minnesota's play volume is always going to be lower. Like, Chicago, really tough matchup on the road. I don't think Dalvin Cook's going to draw much ownership at 8,300, but volume trumps all at running back, right? So, I mean, he's still in play. Like, you have to have him in your player pool and at least take a second look at him. But with the value that we have at running back, which I think is actually pretty good value, um, normally we don't typically – go down for those guys, but I think that they're interesting still. Eckler, I, you could see them just completely riding him just now that uh, Gordon's going to be back, hopefully next week. Um, I, I don't know, AK, I, I played Eckler last last week and got the floor game from him, so I, I, maybe I'm, I'm a little bit biased against Eckler at this point, um, but I mean, he's going to get those high volume, or kind of high equity touches against Miami, worst defense in the league. Anyone that's just been sacking against Miami has been been doing really well. Um, I think one other guy that we probably should mention is Chris Carson. He's a guy that I warmed up to towards the end of last week, just with the Penny injury. seems like Penny's going to be back. Um, if he wouldn't have been, I think he would have been just as good, as good a play, maybe a better play this week than he was last week, just based on uh, the matchup against Arizona and the plays involved. But um, not so much on Carson at this point. I think if you're just looking purely um, for the guys that can get you really strong value, Wayne Gallman, on Johnson, that mid-range, if you do decide to go there, um, but I think as far as ceiling, it, it's still Eckler, McCaffrey, and I would even throw uh, David Johnson, Dalvin Cook into that range. Uh, but um, significant discount for for uh, for David Johnson. So I, I think that he's a guy that's super interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I can understand where you're coming from due to the fact that you, you know, played Eckler last week and then he had his bad game. And I would have agreed with you. I would have actually even said he was a fade this week going against Miami if Justin Jackson was playing because we could have seen a very similar thing to what we saw from like Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard, where they were just up so big so quickly that Zeke kind of becomes irrelevant and he doesn't have the ceiling of what he normally would have. Pollard comes in, goes for 120 yards from scrimmage. That's what we could have seen from Justin Jackson. Now that he's out, it seems like Eckler, like there's no, his floor seems to be like 16, 18 points PPR wise, because they're going to throw the ball to him. They're going to, they're going to feed him the rock, you know, throughout the entire game. So, Eckler, I mean, with with Dalvin Cook at 8,300 um, against the Chicago Bears defense, it seems like I, I would definitely be taking Eckler over Dalvin Cook there. Maybe Cook becomes a tournament play just because most people will be fading him in favor of Eckler uh, going against Chicago. But let's talk about some of these wide receivers, man, because I keep going back to this Arizona-Seattle game. I'm like, I, almost, I wish they had a super flex lineup for DraftKings where I can go with Kyler, Russell Wilson – then go Lockett, Kirk, Fitz, DK Metcalf, you know, Will Disley. Vigil did that for a little bit last year. It's actually pretty fun. Really? Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. They don't have it anymore? I think they got rid of it. There wasn't a ton of interest there, believe it or not, but it was kind of cool to be able to play two quarterbacks. Yeah, I was doing uh, – do you play best ball throughout the summer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was in uh, 
I, I was talking to the guys at draft and I was like giving them suggestions for their platform. And I was like, y'all got to open up a super flex draft spot. So that's something hopefully that we see them implement more. Cause obviously for season long, that's, that'll be the mainstream within the next year or two, probably all of my leagues that I play are super flex. But besides the point, we have to take one quarterback, right? And if we're, if we're paying up for Christian McCaffrey, if we're paying up for Austin Eckler, if we're paying up for all these guys, we have to pull back on the money somewhere, and it's probably going to be at the wide receiver position trying to hammer values. As far as I'm concerned, we're looking at Christian Kirk and Fitz. If you take out all the, du the dudes who played last night, the guys who have already played four games, right? We're looking at the guys who have only played three games. Christian Kirk right now is fourth in the NFL in targets. Larry Fitzgerald is sixth in the NFL in targets. Tyler Lockett is 13th. So you have three players here who you could choose from who are top 13 in targets for the NFL season so far. In a PPR formatted league, you have Fitz at 5,600. I can't believe Kirk is 5,100. Lockett's a little more expensive at 63. I would probably end up fading Lockett at this point and even go with a guy like DK Metcalf at $4,800. But between those players in that game, I almost feel like I have to take two of those guys, right? Like, um, there is other value at the wide receiver position. I like Kenny Galladay at 5,900 against the Chiefs. I feel like he's probably in a good spot to eat. McLaurin, I'm sure, would have been the absolute, like, everybody would have been on McLaurin prior to this hamstring injury that he's dealing with. He didn't practice at all on Friday, so that does not look good for his um, game-time decision to suit up against the Giants, who have let up literally everything. Janoris Jenkins literally just donates fantasy points. McLaurin's been eating, still at 4,500, so that's just a ridiculous value. You're not going to be able to play him. So it seems like we're going to have to hammer this Arizona-Seattle game, correct? Yeah, I'm with you. The McLaurin thing, he's, he's going to be just piled on. Um, I, I think that a lot of people still like his, his price didn't move because they were the, the primetime game last week, right? So it's really tough to get away from him. In cash situations, I'm not sure it's uh, the exact play as Nelson Aguilar, a totally different type of player and totally different type of usage. But um, that price is, is really tough to get away from. I think the, the Cardinals guys, I, I'm definitely interested. I always tend to skew towards Christian Kirk. Um, again, my biases maybe getting the best of me with the, the Larry Fitzgerald play. Uh, I am really high on DJ. I don't want to play three though. Um, yeah. So if I, if I get there, I, I think Kirk would probably be the guy that I prefer. I mean, but their prices are both like super reasonable. They're not seeing the deep targets, but I mean, there's a lot of values on DraftKings in particular, just like knowing that you have such a strong floor with those guys. I, I think I like Lockett a little bit more than you. I think, I think there's, he's playing on the outside. 72.6% of his routes actually have come from the slot this year. I had that backwards originally. but So he's probably going to get Tremaine Brock for most of the game, who's been absolutely shredded. Uh, 16 targets against. He's given up 10 receptions for 229 yards and two touchdowns. That's at least 70 yards in each week. So um, even when he's out wide, I, I think that, I mean, they don't have Patrick Peterson still. So um, I think that it is a smash spot for Lockett. But um, if we're going to try and play Eckler, if we're going to try and play Christian McCaffrey, it's going to be a lot harder to get there. Um, so I, th I think that McLaren is the guy that is the best way to save. Um, as of now, even Trey Quinn is 3K. I don't think he's going to play this weekend. Oh, he's not? Is that, so I missed that. Well, he didn't practice at all on Friday. And typically hamstrings come with like a 10-day plus. Oh, yeah, there it is. Questionable. Tag. There so, you go. Uh, so the projections that I'm looking at haven't adjusted for that yet, and his ownership still expected to be really high. So we'll have to keep an eye on that throughout the week. If he does play, hamstrings are scary, man, especially in DFS. Like that might just absolutely bury your team. I'm, uh, yeah, it's killing me because in one of my season long leagues, I just traded Tyler Boyd and Miles Sanders for um, a couple other players with the reasoning Tyler Boyd was like my second flex play, but I had McLaurin mm -hmm. on the bench. So I was like, all right, perfect. I'll get rid of Boyd. McLaurin fucking gets in there, fills in perfectly. One day later, you know, he pops up on the injury report with a hamstring. Didn't practice that day. Now he's not practicing today, which tells me that he's, you know, 50-50 at best right now. So that scares me. You think that benefits Paul Richardson or Trey Quinn more? Paul Richardson. I think that, like, I, I think at this point, Paul Richardson is has a very similar role to Terry McLaurin. He's just not as good. He's not as technically mm -hmm. sound, and he's just not as good of, like, a deep threat at this point. But Paul Richardson, I mean, we've seen him be really good when he was on the field and healthy, you know, back in yeah. his – Seattle days so uh, I, I think I think Paul Richardson is probably a very very good value right now do you know do you have his price up 3700 so I mean he's probably the guy that you're going to use to save especially if there's no McLaurin um, yeah. I, I will say that if he's out there and does happen to play I mean who knows if he's going to be a decor or what but um, all these guys are, are priced in such a great spot against the Giants I, I think you have to consider him even on the road 
Um, a couple other guys that are really cheap. I, if you're just looking for like a flyer in GPPs, I, I do think that Deion Kane is interesting at 3,200. Like talking about like absolute, like almost stone men um, against Oakland. I, I still think that Deion Kane's a really um, kind of talented guy. I mean, we won't have T.Y. Hilton this week. So I, I think that he's someone that you could look to all the way down. Um, if you want to look all the way at the top, we should probably touch on Keenan Allen, at least for, yeah. for five seconds. Um, he's only 7,600. He was 70, I think he was 7K last week. So I mean, his price is still totally fine. Like we talked about uh, weighted opportunity rating is like my favorite metric at uh, for wide receivers. It's just smashing the entire league. He's still 7,600. So I who else is going to catch, who else is going to catch passes there besides Eckler and Keenan Allen this week with Mike Williams already ruled yeah, out. That he's down, now he's, yeah. It's, uh, who knows? Like, <laughs> and it's, it's a great matchup, right? So it could just be yeah. Keenan Allen for 17 targets. Like it, it could happen easily. I know. Um, it seems like, like you don't want to pay up for wide receiver, but it's almost like you're, doing yourself a disservice if you don't like he's going to be the wide receiver one you know 80 percent chance this week I'm, I'm not scared i think to go like super stars and scrubs this week just to try and get keenan allen in like you get in it eckler keenan allen christian mccaffrey and then just see what you can build from there like you might end up on someone like Deion kane at 3200 you might have to play a guy like like trey quinn something like that um pay down at defense tight end i think there's a couple options uh that are very strong at the lower end as well which we'll talk about but I think those are the guys. I think one more guy that I'll mention that's kind of in a weird salary range, but I think still has a ton of upside, Marquise Brown, um, Hollywood Brown. And he's just, he left so many air yards on the field last week that I think that um, with everyone kind of zoned into these quarterbacks, I mentioned that Lamar might be a decent pivot if you wanted to go completely different in tournaments, him to Marquise Brown. Um, I will say Cleveland's pass rush is pretty impressive. So um, that would obviously hurt a guy who's going to be getting downfield like Marquise Brown. But uh, 5,800 is a weird price point. He's 200 more than Larry Fitzgerald, and I definitely prefer Fitzgerald kind of in a vacuum. But from an upside perspective, I think Hollywood Brown is it could be one of your guys. Yeah, dude, I love Hollywood Brown. I mean, the, the target volume he's getting is ridiculous, and it's not like they're using him just in screens or like short slant routes. He's getting, like you said, all these air yards. Denzel Ward did not practice again on Friday, so it looks like he's going to miss his second straight week, which who's obviously their top cover corner who would probably be on uh, Hollywood Brown. So it's like on any given week, just the opportunity that Brown is getting, he could put up, you know, seven for 175 and, and two scores like we saw in, the, in their first game, and then we saw him have a, a nice game in their second game. So I like uh, Hollywood Brown. Even at 5,800, seems like they're adjusting to his price point like more quickly than a lot of the other guys. So I kind of like that. Pivot. Yeah, they were aggressive with him, like very aggressive, which is something we saw with Sammy Watkins early in the season. It's probably warranted, though. One guy that's kind of gone the other way, and I'm just going to go broke chasing this, I think, but Will Fuller is 4,500. Uh, um, uh, that seems crazy. I thought he was a great play last week. I, I, I can't remember. You're, you're not a big Will Fuller guy, right? Uh, yeah, I own him in a lot of season long, but like I, I played him in either week one or two. I remember whenever it was like Jalen Ramsey on D hop and I was like, Oh, he's going to be able to run around with Jacksonville open. But Kenny Stills is just too involved right now. Kenny Stills is getting a, too many of those deep targets for this to be like, Oh, well, Will Fuller is eventually going to break out. And like, I'm sure he will have a couple big games, but I, I can't like, uh, I, I can't get on board with Will Fuller right now. I just can't. Can't, can't, can't condone it, huh? Uh, all right, well, let's uh, – so another, like, really bad matchup. So someone in GVPs, you get a low ownership. Allen Robinson, 5,600. He's not probably near as good a play as some of these other guys we've talked about. Um, I don't really care about um, just the wide receiver cornerback matchup, per se, if he ends up facing Rhodes. Um, but, I mean, his – talk about weighted opportunity rating. He's the guy from a price perspective outside of Marquise Brown that really stands out. Um, yep. as someone that definitely has some upside and, and just probably hasn't gotten there um, in comparison to where his fantasy points have been, but his targets are still extremely strong. So I'm interested in Robinson at 5,600. So. Yeah, that makes sense. He's a guy I've been telling a lot of people to buy low on in the uh, season long because he's going to have his bad games with Mitch Trubisky, but eventually just given the volume that he has, those, those good games are coming. He's, and you'll probably be able to tell when the good games are coming just based on a lot of the matchups. Like, yeah, I mean, Xavier Rhodes is not a scary cornerback anymore. He's not who he used to be. So, a lot of the time, you know, he'll be getting decent matchups with very high volume, and that will eventually translate. He's got a good floor, and for the amount of disappointing games that he's had so far, like he's someone that you could absolutely um, kind of buy low on. But let's move over to the tight end position. Now, again, you know, we've talked about paying up for a lot of guys, so it's going to be hard to grab the Travis Kelseys. Um, Detroit's been good against the tight end so far this year, so I'm not sure he's necessarily a guy I'm looking to. Uh, pay up for Evan Ingram seems like he's going to be in a smash spot 
Again, with Danny Dimes, he's just looked so good this year, and he's $1,500 less than Kelsey. Darren Waller is getting a ridiculous target share right now. Um, and if we have Darius Leonard out, again, uh, this passing defense could be a little bit worse than a lot of people expect. Uh, you know, I hate to keep going back to the Seattle game, and I feel like they're going to end up – it's going to end up being like a 19-14 to 14 game, and we're going to cost a lot of people a lot of money. But Will Disley just seems to be so involved in this offense – and he is priced at $3,600 coming off of a two-touchdown game. Where is your head at right now with the tight end spot? Um, are you paying up for one, or is Will Disley a guy that you're looking at? Oh, yeah, Will Disley. Uh, he's going to be the chalk, but, I mean, I think he's a really good play. Um, I mean, at, at his price, like we talked about, how are we going to get up to Keenan Allen? How are we going to play the running backs we want to play? Well, Disley's $3,600. Um, I, I love Darren Waller. I still love that play. I just don't know how I'm going to make it work in lineup construction. Will Disley, I mean, this Cardinals team's allowed 23 catches, 348 yards, and five touchdowns to tight ends in three games. Um, I, I don't normally get completely kind of crazy about matchup and that sort of thing, especially this early in the season, but um, the plays are going to be there. I think that his price is in a spot where I think that he's probably pretty good chalk at tight end, which is historically not a, a great position overall. So even if you get Kind of a dud from him. I, I don't think it buries you this week. Like I love Evan Ingram. Um, like I said, love Darren Waller. I'm just not sure how I'm going to make it work. I, I think I actually prefer Waller um, kind of in a vacuum between those, and that might be an unpopular take, but um, Indy just funnels targets to tight ends as well. And, and I got to watch Darren Waller just catch like dink and dunk passes all the way up the field for the Vikings. Like I was nowhere near playing Waller last week against the Vikings, but he's just so involved that I, I think that he's really – um, one of those guys that it would be tough for him to fail at this point. Um, both both of those guys are great plays, Ingram and Waller. You're, you're on it today, man. You're, you're on a lot of the same plays I was going to bring up, so that's good to see. Yeah, man, I'm getting a little bit better. And since I have all the money in my account, I got serious this week because I'm going to actually throw a little bit of money down on the table and hopefully see a little bit of, a, of an ROI. And I have you to thank for that because obviously I'm learning each week, week to week. You know, we're getting a little bit better at this. I'm, I'm learning what things to look at when we're talking about things from a DFS standpoint. Um, a lot of my audience is obviously season long stuff. Um, speaking of my audience, if you guys are enjoying the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. If you're joining us on Twitch, you can find me on uh, on YouTube, Nick Ercolano. It's E-R-C-O-L-A-N-O. -O. Joe obviously has his YouTube, so all the social media links will be linked in the description of this video, as well as probably pinned on the comment section of it. So we've covered all of the positions so far, except for defense now it's really fun to just play the team that's playing against the Miami Dolphins every week um, that happens to be the LA Chargers and accordingly they are priced as the most expensive team on the slate at $3,800 uh, if I'm looking at some of the lower priced teams as always I try to get home teams that are favorites and uh, are going against teams that will pass the ball or turn the ball over a lot now I think Baltimore is interesting uh, against Cleveland at $3,200 just because Baltimore's defense. I, th I think it's just a big mismatch between Cleveland's offensive line and Baltimore's pass rush, and I could see them forcing a lot of sacks on Baker Mayfield, who has almost no time to throw the ball. He's been pretty erratic with his accuracy, which has been surprising to see, so we could see some turnovers through the air. Um, Indianapolis, I would I would like this, you know, as touchdown favorites at home against the Oakland Raiders, but again, they're going to be without – well, maybe they'll be without Darius Leonard, maybe without their top cover corner and Desaire. Um, so I'm not sure I really love the Colts defense right now. Where is your head at when it comes to defenses for this week? Yeah, there's actually quite a few defenses that I like this week. Like, sure, you can pay up for, for the Chargers against the Dolphins. Like, yeah, they're, they're super expensive. I don't know if it's a week where that's uh, super optimal. I actually think that the Rams are interesting against Tampa Bay. It, it might be one of the better O-line, yeah. uh, D-line matchups as well. Um, Rams are our top half of the league, at least in adjusted sack rate, but bottom six for Tampa Bay. So they're giving up a ton. Um, we know that Jameis Winston, he'll throw picks, uh, highest interception rate in the entire main slate. So I think that that's interesting. There's there's a couple other spots. Uh, one thing that I will say is everyone wants to target the Seahawks and Cardinals game because it's good in passing environment, all those sort of things. But I actually don't think that the Seahawks are terrible in this spot either. Um, I, I think that uh, Kyler's Coop will take sacks, but I mean, this offensive line versus defensive line, if you want to talk about that, I think the Seahawks will be able to get pressure on this Cardinals O line that's that's really struggled. Um, other side of that, uh, very similar type of matchup, Bears against Vikings. If you really wanted to 
to go there. I know the Vikings don't pass a lot, but their offensive line is just absolutely horrendous. And I do think that the Bears are still one of the better pressure teams in the entire league. So those are the ones that I'm kind of zoned in on right now. Um, I, I do think that there's some really cheap options that are at least interesting. Um, Carolina 2300 against Deshaun Watson. I mean, Carolina is a team that doesn't pressure near as much. So I, I think that I don't like that one near as much. But if you wanted to pay all the way down, I, I think that they're at least in play. Um, I think Seattle at, at 3300 on the road, I, I'm, with, I'm with you. I don't typically play um, defenses on the road either, but this might be a spot um, where it would make some sense. I, I think that in the mid range, it's the Rams um, paying all the way up. I, I do like the Baltimore car or call as well um, against Cleveland. I, I think that that's one that makes a lot of sense that I hadn't considered uh, probably enough yet. 3200 is a good price for them. Um, so they're they're probably I mean they're uh, cheaper even than than Seattle. So that's an interesting one. But a lot of times we want to try and leverage ownership at defense, especially in tournaments when a touchdown can just break the slate. It feels like on some of these. So uh, if we're just looking purely from um, ownership leverage perspective, I, I think that that Chicago might be coming at the lowest owned of these, uh, but I could be completely wrong. Those, I think we're on uh, similar ones. Narrowing it down is probably just going to come down to, to roster construction like uh, like it does every week. I, I will say we had a question in the chat, too, that I wanted to touch on that um, someone's asking if you can go two tight ends. Um, I typically don't do this. I, I almost always play a running back in the flex. I think that if you're playing really large field tournaments, there are slates, maybe even this slate, if you're going to try and jam in uh, Keenan Allen, where it's fine to play a wide receiver in the flex, but um, 99 out of 100 times, I, I play running back in the flex. I don't really do the two tight end thing. I think that's pretty thin. Yeah, I'd agree with you. I'm not someone who would probably throw two tight ends into it just because they're more of like a, a floor play, I feel like. Even the top guys, a lot of them don't give you that weekly ceiling play that you're looking for in uh, in a lot of these lineups. So I probably would shy away from tight ends. But you going back to the defense, like it's so tough to pick defenses. Like over the long run, when you're playing season long, you could usually just stream, again, favorites that are playing at home. But on a week-to-week -week basis, it's very hard because, like you said, a touchdown is what breaks the seal for the most part. When you look back on the entire season and you look at the rankings of defenses – what stands out is it's not the best defenses that are the best fantasy defenses. It's literally the ones that score the most. Like right now, I was looking at defensive ranks, and the Jets are like the number two or three defense in the NFL right now. They're 0-3. They've given up a ton of points, but they've scored like three or four defensive touchdowns already, which gets them up there. Because in, in a game or in fantasy football, a game where defenses are decided by like one point per game difference, when you look at the long haul of things, a touchdown is six points. And that's the difference between averaging – seven and a half points a game and eight and a half points per game, which is defense 15 versus defense seven. So a lot of it, you know, do, do what you think is the best. I would usually say, just go with your gut. That's what I tell people when they're drafting, you can do as much research as you want on the defense. Um, but again, they're all like a hundred dollars off. So, so take whoever you want to take. I feel like there's, it's very, very hard to, to hit on these defenses when touchdowns ends up being the, uh, the difference for these defenses. Any last words or general strategy for week four slates, Mr. Joe? Yeah, I think that that's, uh, that pretty much covers it. I'm on the same page as defense. I don't care a whole lot about them allowing points. Just care about pressure, passing attempts, just giving yourself the best chance to have those, uh, those turnovers and defensive touchdowns. Um, if anyone wants to come hang out on Sunday morning, I'll be here on Twitch live at 1130 Eastern time before kickoff. Come, out, come by, ask some questions. A lot can change on Sunday mornings, as you know. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty much it, man. I think we, we covered a lot. It, it's an interesting slate. Um, I do think that it's one of those ones where um, I, I think there's less spots to go. So my, my player pool at this time of the week is usually a, lot, a little bit larger than it is right now. So um, we're pretty zoned in. So I might, might, might be a little bit scary in that way as well. Yeah, I feel like I feel like we had a lot of the same takes today. So our lineups will probably be very similar. Uh, I'll let you know how I do because this will be one of the very rare weeks in which I do participate. But I'm feeling strong after today's video. Uh, I hope you guys are feeling the same way. Again, if you enjoy the video, hit that thumbs up. Make sure you're following Joe on all the social media, Twitter, Instagram, even LinkedIn, YouTube. He's got the whole interwebs working for himself. So that will be uh, linked down below. And uh, subscribe to the channel if you are new. We'll see you back here on next Saturday's video for our Week 5 DFS slate. Peace. Hey!